Welcome to the Common Sense Show, and we are in for another round of a wonderful discussion with uh, a business expert. And today I have Ralph Velasco, um, and he's going to go into a little bit about what he does with his business. But before we go into that, I just wanted to remind you that if you haven't already to get notified of updates and when there's a live interview, when there's more content to watch, when I have exclusive Q and A's, make sure you subscribe to common sense show dot locals.com. Join the common sense show community so that you can be kept up to date with all things common sense show. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe on the uh, during the pro during the conversation with Ralph if you have um, if you like what you're seeing. And uh, today we have quite a unique episode. We're going to talk about a tr the travel business essentially, and you know, we haven't had a travel expert on before, uh, but this should be very interesting. I like d diving into the both the economics and the structures of different kinds of businesses. And today we're talking about the travel business and why it's it's popular in Ralph's specific niche. So without further ado, we're going to bring my guest on, Ralph Valesco. Ralph, welcome to the Common Sense Show. Appreciate you joining me today. Hey, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, so you have been organizing and leading these small group cultural tours around the world since 2008. Um, tell me a little bit about your business, the Continental Drifter, what it is, uh, what's your unique value proposition, and uh, what, what sets you apart? Sure. So I uh, just recently rebranded to Continental Drifter Experiences for my tours. And as you mentioned, I organize and lead small group tours around the world, uh, anywhere from six to 10 participants. And we go to such places as India, Vietnam, Cuba, Antarctica, uh, all throughout Europe and a lot of different destinations. And uh, I have been doing this for about 16 years now and uh, have all five star rated trips from my past clients. And I tend to uh, lean towards a little bit older crowd, maybe 40s plus uh, people that uh, have the time and freedom to travel and have an interest in these types of trips with uh, wine tasting, great food experiences. Uh, oftentimes we'll stay at a private 11th century castle or a, a wine estate or beautiful boutique hotel where the property itself is a destination. Cause I know sometimes uh, we can't wait to leave the hotel or we feel guilty staying at the hotel. And I always felt that there are such beautiful properties that uh, could be a destination themselves. So I'm starting to move towards more of that type of experiential <laughs> travel. What made you even get into the travel business? Um, is it something that you enjoyed before you decided to go full in? Oh, yeah. Uh, since I was 15, I uh, studied in Spain for a summer. And the next year, I was a volunteer in Peru. The next year, I was a volunteer in Venezuela. And then I studied in Mexico City for a summer. So from a very young age, I'd been traveling on my own or with uh, like school groups, volunteer groups. And so I was, I was hooked from day one. And so uh, I always just wanted to try to figure out a way to make a living from travel. But to me, it was about as likely as my becoming a rock star, uh, you know, 30 years ago before the internet, before social media and all that stuff, but uh, before digital photography. So as I started out, uh, photography was sort of my niche. That was where I was teaching people how to use the, these new digital devices that were coming out uh, about 20, 25 years ago. And so that was uh, uh, how I wanted to differentiate myself. And so I was uh, attracting more people that were interested in photography. But I, uh, I taught a course called uh, Tour Organizer Training, uh, Get Paid to Travel. And in it, uh, I spoke about uh, having a niche, uh, you know, being whether it's a language or it's food or it's photography, but uh, having a niche so that people could come to your trips uh, for a specific reason. 
And so photography started out to be that. I've I've gotten a little bit away from that. I was never like a photo tours or photo workshop type photographer or tour organizer, but something more casual and in between. So someone could bring a friend or a spouse who wasn't necessarily interested in photography, but would still have a great time. I mean, who doesn't like to be out when there's beautiful light and there's less crowds and it's cooler and uh, whether or not you've got a camera doesn't really matter. So that's what I was going for. Nice. And so um, what did you think about, well, first of all, what did, did you have to learn? What did you have to learn about becoming um, to going into the travel business? Did, was there, um, certification classes? Is it just hands-on experience? Is it something that there are mentors for? How did you get so sophisticated with putting these to get putting the business together? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I kind of was self-taught. I didn't have any mentors. I mean, I did research of what other people were doing, um, but I kind of figured this out myself. Uh, I started leading a couple trips for some other companies. So I got a little bit of a flavor for what they were doing, but I was doing it after I'd already started my trips. Uh, but I started very slowly. Uh, I started, you know, I didn't start doing trips to Antarctica. Um, I started with a little two hour walking tours or sitting across the kitchen table from someone that wanted to learn their new one megapixel camera. Uh, local walking tours in the area. I was living in Southern California at the time. Uh, mm. Went to half days and full days. I started doing weekends to the local uh, Joshua Tree National Park or uh, Death Valley, bringing groups back to Chicago so that I could get a free trip home. Um, so it built it built up very slowly. So I made a lot of mistakes along the way, especially early on, but. Um, I'm pretty good at learning from my mistakes and trying not to make those again. So it was a slow burn. And eventually um, now all I do is international tours to uh, some pretty incredible destinations. Yeah, that's pretty slick. So what is, uh, what are the economics of having a travel business is, uh, are there <clears throat> outsized expenses? Like if there's someone watching this, who's an entrepreneur who wants to um, start a travel business, what should they expect? in terms of uh, financial involvement to get in and to get up operationally um, to the point where they can, you know, lead tours as you are doing right now. Um, what should be the expectations for someone looking to pursue a travel business? Well, um, you know, don't look to get rich. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a lifestyle business. So I get to travel to some of the most amazing places in the world. I get paid to do that. I get paid pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. But I have decided to create a business where uh, I'm sort of the only person. I've tried to bring on other uh, people to lead tours for me, to scale the business. But uh, for various different reasons, that didn't work out. Um, and so I went back to sort of the the idea that you know, I can kind of only trust myself. Mm -hmm. um, I had leaders that uh, weren't showing up, you know, for trips and I had to cancel my plans to, to, you know, instead lead that trip. And it was just a headache that I, uh, I just didn't want to deal with. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to do and lead all my own trips. So I was never able to scale the business, you know, bigger where I've got, you know, 10 people leading trips for me that I don't have to be on but uh it's a pretty great lifestyle and um i definitely make a living but uh you know it's it's not uh, millions of dollars a year that's for sure but um the perks are incredible and i've always thought and uh, just in general that if something were to happen to me tomorrow and i couldn't lead another trip or i i don't know i got incapacitated or something I've done and seen more things than most people will ever see in their lives. And for me, that was enough. It, you know, if I die tomorrow, it doesn't matter how much money I have in my bank account. I've had the experiences. And to me, that's much more important than money. Uh, yeah, money's great. It makes the world go round. We need it. But um, 
you know, we spend our life making money and then perhaps you have a ton of it and you get incapacitated or you get hit by a bus and who cares? So that's the way I've looked at it. Yeah, actually, I think you bring up a good point, like a really good point here, which is that, you know, when you start a business, the business is supposed to serve your life. It's not supposed to, you're, you're not supposed to spend your life serving your business. And I know that there's a period of time where that is the case. And usually it's in the early stages of a business and you're trying to get it running. And so you almost have to run all over the place just to kind of keep it up and going. But the, but the point that you're making, I think is really important, which is you find a hole in the marketplace, a place where consumers want to spend money, where they, where you can make a difference, um, where there is a gap where either you're on the experiential side, service side, product side, whatever the case is. But there are things that are more important, I think, when running a business, um, like you say, than than simple and than just money. And I think that it's a it's a good lesson for small business owners who are who create businesses out of passions and hobbies, right? That they can pursue something that they enjoy, they can make money and make a decent living, you know, based off of what they enjoy. And your goals for running this business um, are your, are personal to you. And I think that that is that is a, an aspect of business ownership that's not always or frequently taught about when um, when people talk about businesses and 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 why you should start a business. And because if you can understand your why you start the business, then you'll, then you'll never lose that passion if you always keep that with you. Um, and it seems like you've been a testament to that. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I like to think so. And uh, I've always tried to live my life that way. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy with what I've seen and done. And it's not like, uh, you know, to, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to do it when I retire. Because someday never comes and uh, who knows... Uh, <laughs> what you know what what's going to happen to us tomorrow so start living your life today is what was my my feeling tell me about your best day um in your business and then tell me about your worst day like during the trip like what what happened well the best thing that happens during my trips is getting to share these amazing places with people um i go in advance of almost every trip and i scout out the destination in advance by myself with a local guide with my local tour operator just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, see and do two to three times the amount of things we could possibly do with a group uh, when i bring them back typically a year later because i need a year to put the trip together organize it market it etc uh, i want to go there during the time period that i would bring the group back to so that I've got pictures that are similar to, you know, that season or harvest or whatever it might be. But uh, so I work uh, far in advance. So I get to see and meet all these people. And and then I get to put the trip together, the puzzle, pieces of the puzzle of the trip together into a cohesive uh, trip that makes sense uh, timing wise, efficiency, et cetera. And, um, you know, like I said, uh, you know, it's, it takes me a lot. It's, it's a lot easier for me to see a site as a single person than it is for me to bring 10 people there. Uh, you know, I don't want to rush people through places. So um, I, that to me, when I bring back a group and I get to share these places with them, share, uh, introduce them to these amazing people that I meet along the way, the artisans, the craftsmen and women, uh, the business people, the the wine cellar owners, et cetera. Um, I, that to me is the best part of my business is getting, uh, seeing the destination through their eyes now mm -hmm. and then hearing about, you know, how much they enjoyed it, getting the testimonials and things after. Uh, the worst days are, uh, or the worst thing, you know, that can happen or has happened is I've had a couple uh, ladies break ankles on trips just from, um, you know, falling on a, some gravel, you know, nothing mm -hmm. like a, it wasn't a serious hike or anything. And, and my theory is that, uh, you know, we're much more cautious when we've, we're going on a serious hike and watching where we put every foot 
but when we're just you know walking down a driveway you're, you're much less uh focused and so i've had a couple of people slip on just gravel and and right. break ankles and so uh that to me is terrible because then perhaps the person misses the rest of the trip or it really affects their trip uh, could affect other people on the trips experience so uh, those are always that's always my worst fear is that someone gets hurt on a trip yeah i i can <clears throat> see how that obviously would be difficult and, and it's so true that you know we have as humans we have this these antenna that go up in places that are not familiar <clears throat> you're looking for threats you're looking for danger when you're out there in the wild and of course getting on the hotel shuttle to get to, to go on the adventure um is where a person might get injured you know it's yeah. happened to me a, a, more than a few times when i was on when i was away so i i completely get that um what is it that what is it that um <clears throat> from a business perspective um you think makes like travel or organizing this travel like worth it every single time? Is it just the differences in places that you go? Is it the fact that you're observing people observe what you already know is going to be awe-inspiring for them? Like when they see it, like what is it that, that drives you to, to do this over and over again? Yeah, I go to a lot of the same places over and over again, bringing groups back year after year, maybe even multiple times per year. And uh, every trip's different, of course, because you've got different people on the trip. You're meeting maybe different people. Uh, I'm always trying to improve the trip. So each year may be a little bit different. So tweaking things, making them better as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, certain, you know, unfortunately, people that we meet along the way, these wonderful craftsmen and women, they pass away and we have to make some other kind of arrangement, meet someone else. So things change. So it's, it's always going to be different, but then uh, I do like the familiarity of going back to these places. And mm. because I do get to meet a lot of the same people and I become very good friends with them over the years, whether they're my local tour operator, my local guides, which I always try to use the same guides year after year. Uh, it's very important that the guides know me and the way I run my business, the way I run my trips. So mm -hmm. to have to sort of start over again with new guides, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I like to work with the same guides that that know my my style. Um, and uh, so to me, that's uh, that's something that that you know going back to these places over and over again doesn't get boring for me. Although after a certain period of time, I do like to uh, create new trips to new places to keep my interest. But also mm -hmm. I've got clients that have been on 20, 25 of my trips wow. and they've been to all the places that I might have on the calendar. And I don't do 25 trips a year, but I might do 10 or 12 and I rotate them. And so mm -hmm. I bring back older trips. I'll create new ones and uh, like uh, just did Antarctica this year and last year for the first time. So, um, you know, that's a very popular destination. And so I love creating new trips, but it's very expensive. Uh, cost mm. me the time to go there, to scout it, to pay for the scouting trip. Um, and, you know, a lot of, you know, have to wait a year, like I said, before I market the trip. So it's a very time intensive and, and uh, capital intensive uh, undertaking. So, right. and the fact that I've already created over 30 trips, um, you know, I'm starting to think, why should I be spending money on creating more, more and more new trips? Um, you know, cause the expense may not always be worth it. So that's, uh, that's what I try to do at that, you know, with that kind of thing. So when, when you encourage, um, cause obviously there's a photography component to your business and it's a big part of it. You want the people who are in your groups to capture the moments and, and, you know, obviously to take it from different perspectives and you teach them how to use the cameras and things. Um, what are some of the, the basics that you, that you teach your, your clients, um, when it comes to photography, like in capturing moments, but not losing the enjoyment of being present on the trip? Sure. 
Well, the, the first tip in my 101 photo tips book is that it's not about the camera. So it doesn't matter what kind of camera you have. You don't need a camera. As I mentioned, you could just see it through your mind's eye. But uh, a lot of times people think, oh, you know, to come on your trips, I have to have a very expensive DSLR camera, tripods, lenses, et cetera. And that's not the case, especially today. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm shooting more and more with my smartphone. I've got clients that are coming on my trips that are putting away the DSLRs and the micro four third systems and bringing just their smartphones because they're so powerful these days. And yeah. they're, the quality is fantastic. They're always in our pockets. They mm -hmm. do other things rather than just take pictures like video, slow motion, time lapse, audio, uh, you know, et cetera, panoramas. So these devices in our pockets are extremely powerful. We can share directly from them. We can edit on them. So, um, and I'm shooting more video because I have a, a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that I knew I needed to make it simple and I needed to do it with my phone. So I've got a gimbal and uh, it works out great. So, uh, but then the, I was gonna say that the last tip in my book is put the camera down. And by that, I mean, don't go through this once in a lifetime trip with your eye to the viewfinder and seeing everything through your phone or your camera lens. Uh, I, I, I say travel photography is made up of two words, spend as, spend as much time traveling as you are photographing. So hmm. put that camera down and experience the place. Uh, the more I go to a place, it's easy. It's easier for me to say, you know, I've been to Cuba 18 times, so I can mm -hmm. put the camera down. I feel like I've gotten a lot of the photos and videos, although it's always different. But, um, you know, someone comes on a first trip and all they want to do is take pictures. And I understand that. But I'm trying to encourage people. And the more I travel, the more I go back to these places or just go anywhere in the world, I try to just settle down sit in a cafe sit in a bar at, you know at the having a beer and just absorb the place mm. not always thinking that i have to photograph it because it's uh it's a big responsibility it's it's a lot of work um you know it's a lot of mind energy you know thinking that you've always got to be photographing or feeling guilty when you're not photographing or you miss mm. a sunrise or a sunset so I've right. never created my trips like that, where it's all photography 24 seven and some leaders do that. So my mm -hmm. trips are very casual. And when it comes to photography, you don't even need a camera. Like I said, how is <laughs> without fail, you know, my wife always overpacks for our trips <laughs> and, uh, there's way more shirts than needed and dresses and shorts and pants. It's like sure. <laughs> everything. Yeah. Um, and I feel like packing is an art. Like, obviously I feel like the more you, the more you travel, the better you get at it. It's like any other skill um, because you realize how much, uh, how many pieces of clothes you need. And what it, do you have any magic rules for, 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 travel packing travel obviously it depends on where you're going if you're going to everest it's different than going to columbia or something but um what is the what are some general rules of thumb that you have for people um who are trying to to get their ratios right of underwear today's stay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny because uh i when i travel i'm typically on the road maybe a month or two at a time and no, I don't want to wear the same five pairs of underwear or same six shirts or, you know, one pair of shoes. So I tend to overpack a little bit. Uh, mm. I don't have a permanent home. I live on the road doing these tours. So, um, you know, if you're doing this once a year for a week or two trip, yeah, pack you know, as little as possible, do laundry on the way, have, ask the hotel to do laundry, do it in the sink, whatever. But uh, for me, I don't want to wear the same pair of shoes for 60 days in a row. So right. I'll bring some different types of shoes. I don't bring the same types of shoes. 
you know, I have one type that's, you know, walk and chew, one's a slip on, blah, blah, blah. But um, like I said, I don't like to wear the same few items for 60 days in a row. So I'm a little bit different. You might think that, uh, you know, I travel so much that, uh, you know, I can get by with one pair of underwear. But of course, that that doesn't that doesn't happen. Um, but for people that uh, are traveling just once or twice a year, I think it's really important because you have to think about being able to lift your own bag, put it in an overhead bin, you know, drag it around on cobblestones and maybe upstairs to an Airbnb or hotel where the elevator didn't work for some reason. So, um, you know, being as light as possible makes a lot of sense. Now, the other thing is that when I go to, you know, when I travel for even two weeks or more, I like to have a cuticle scissors and a Swiss Army knife. That immediately puts me into the have to check my bag uh, category. Right. So, um, you know, if you, if I can get by without those things, I'll try to carry on. If uh, if I if I have a tripod and one extra pair of shoes, that takes up a third of my carry on bag. So hmm. it, it just depends, like you said. So um, there's no magic thing. You know, the old saying is. Uh, pack everything in your bag, and then the day before the trip, take half half the stuff out and bring twice as much money. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the old rule of thumb. But uh, that's you know, funny. Nowadays, uh, you bring a credit card, and I, um, you know, I, I like to have cash. But man, I'm I'm using my credit card 80, 90 percent of the time, and there's so right. much more accepted around the world. It's easier to use our cards outside the u.s than in the u.s it's more secure mm -hmm. you know you go to a restaurant in europe anywhere and they bring the uh, card reader to the table they never take your card go behind the counter who knows what they're doing with it right. it's always at the table they never even hold your card you tap it on the device and you're done mm -hmm. so um it's super advanced in that sense over there uh, but you know almost everyone takes a credit card now, not the little vendor at the local market, probably. So I always recommend having uh, some uh, small bills of local currency. Perhaps it's even U.S. dollars in some places around the world that accept it. But, uh, you know, having and, and nowadays I'm finding more and I'm just getting a couple little tips here, but uh, more and more people are only accepting clean, crisp new bills. No writing on them, no tears. You know, in the U.S., you could, you know, go to the bank with a you know, crumpled up piece of crap uh, bill, <laughs> and they'll and they'll exchange it out for you, which is great. But in these countries, they that's not the case. And even some countries, they don't, they can only be hundred dollar bills that are perfect condition, not even folded. Mm -hmm. So that's the important thing. That's where someone like me comes in to prepare you for that before going to a place so that you don't come with, you know, bills that you didn't know. Hey, Ralph, why didn't you tell me that was the case in this place? Right. Yeah. How do you teach um, your clients how to properly assess for safety uh, of the area that you're traveling to? Uh, you know, there's, it's a case where there's, you know, it doesn't happen. Um, infrequently, but it, it happens frequently enough where you have an American traveling somewhere overseas or someone from one of the Western countries and um, they travel to a place that they don't know as well. Um, they want to get the experience, but they end up in trouble somehow um, because they're just not familiar with what the local customs are or even what the local laws are for things that they consider normal. Um, <clears throat> how do you teach individuals to to properly manage that part of, of the trip, like that part of the safety aspect. Yeah. I, um, I mean, our, our hotels are always in safe places, safe areas, neighborhoods. Uh, I like clean, well-located safe hotels. So that is number one, you know, we're not putting people in bad areas. Um, I try to prepare them for whether or not they can go out on their own at night. I try to stay in places where it's safe to do that. Um, obviously, using just regular common sense uh, mm -hmm. is very, very important. 
But again, it's about the preparation that I give people what to expect in the place, but also not putting them in places where there might be problems. Um, so um, also going out with the minimum amount of items, uh, one credit card, maybe a hundred dollars instead of all your cash on you, you know, because you're afraid that it's back at the hotel, uh, either in the safe or in your suitcase, you know, it's probably safer there than it is on you walking around some city street. You know, some people like to know that it's on them and mm. uh, I, I don't subscribe to that. Um, I don't use hotel safes uh, mainly because I, I, I don't trust myself to remember to, to uh, grab things out of there when I leave the hotel. And uh, although um, every time that we leave a hotel as a group, one of my things is, you know, hey guys, everyone got everything out of the safe, uh, you know, all your personal items, your cords and wires that might still be stuck in the wall, things like that. So I'm always watching out for people like that. And it, and it rarely happens that uh, I think one time someone said, oh, yeah, thanks for reminding me. I, I forgot something in the safe. And, right. um, and uh, that, 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 that's it. But uh, I, I tend to lock everything up in my bag. And, uh, yeah, if someone took my bag, I'd probably be up the creek. But if I'm in a sketchy place, I'll, I'll even uh, use a, a small bike lock or cable lock to lock it to a radiator or the bedpost. Mm. But that's very rare. Very rare. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just, you know, you see sometimes that the people make these arrangements to go and um, travel somewhere and they just, you know, they, they want to stay off the beaten path. And I think that there's some, I think that's some utility to obviously experience in local culture, getting your hands in there, kind of understanding what's local, but also be, don't be stupid, right? If you're not, if you don't think that you can navigate a situation like that, and if and if you just don't know, if you don't know anybody that's gone, if there's no recommendations, if there's no you know guide like yourself to kind of bring someone through that, then it gets significantly tougher to make plans um, to do something. I've been in groups of people who ha were adamant about you know wanting to experience you know local local life, and it's just like, well, what do you know about what happens when you go off, you know? of the path, you know, because that is something completely different. You know, you could accidentally be walking somewhere. The next thing you know, you stumble across some kind of cartel somewhere, <laughs> you know, you never know, um, you know, what you're running into. And a lot of these areas just kind of, they're adjacent to each other, right? They, they right. bump right up against each other and you may not even know where you're going. Absolutely. And, and watching what the locals do are, are there, is there anyone else out on the street? Probably, you know, but they're not. If, uh, you know, you go out and the streets are completely empty and not even the locals are out or asking locals or asking at the hotel, I'll often say, hey, is it OK to walk around this area at night? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is there some parts of the town that I should be uh, concerned about? You know, even is there, you know, a local scam that I should be aware of? And, right. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're more than happy to, to help you because they don't want their clients to get, you know, um, you know, robbed or anything either. So they're, it's in their best interest to help you to, to know how to navigate. Yeah. It can be a death knell for, uh, for hotels and, um, you know, areas around the country to have reviews of people who have gotten robbed and all this other stuff. And that would just kill their business. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do what I do with most experts um, as we approach the end of the, the podcast, which is we're going to talk about, we're going to look at some TikToks. I'm sure that you woke up this morning like I can't wait to look at TikToks uh, for today. <laughs> but these but these um, TikToks are about the, the travel business, and we just want to get your, get, your, um, get your thoughts on them. So let me just pull up the first one. second let me make sure that there's volume all right here we go seriously some of y'all be overthinking the travel business are you already booking your own travel online do you realize that every single time you go on another website that website is not sharing this information to you for free every time you go on these sites and you enter whatever details that you need to book your trip you enter your credit card information and you go on that trip 
that website where you did all of the work actually earn a commission. What I do is coach and train you on how not to throw away your money and your savings by being able to do. All right. I think we get the point there. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you agree with her? Um, Considering starting a agree with her thoughts industry, on, uh, I want to give you some of my, on the, the, the commissions that these sites are getting for people booking travel. Well, um, I think, that they certainly are. That's why they're in business. That's how they're in business. But, uh, you know, if someone's providing me a service, I don't mind them getting a commission. And oftentimes mm -hmm. it doesn't affect the price to me. It's not like they're adding the commission on top of the price, but they, you know, typically, uh, you know, the, the, the hotel will be giving them a slice of the, the, $150 a night or whatever, they're not charging me $165 because they're getting a $10 or 10% 10 10 commission. Um, so I don't mind people getting paid for providing me services. Uh, I don't like to pay unnecessary fees or commissions, that's for sure. But uh, if someone's giving me a, a service that I need, I can't find anywhere else, and is going to save me time, you know, perhaps she's teaching people how to go and go through the back door and it takes you another 15 minutes to do that. Uh, my time's worth something. And so mm -hmm. you just have to make, you, you have to consider that balance. Okay. All right. Awesome. Let's take a look at the next one. This is the secret to starting your own travel business. Than ever to do so. Ever wanted to start your own travel business? That's just making it easier than ever to do so. On our platform, you can start a new hotel commission and create and sell travel guides on your very own travel shop. And if you're a beginner, don't worry. We put together a seller starter kit with free marketing assets as well as a product launch playbook so you can be as successful on the platform as possible. It's literally never been easier to monetize your travel knowledge. Head to thatch.com. Okay, so um, obviously this TikTok is about starting your own travel business and um are there platforms out there if people are watching this where they can start their own travel business um and uh and may earn commissions for their travel knowledge and uh, i guess another question is is do you recommend someone starting a travel business before they have some structural knowledge of specific locations to travel to uh, I, like I said, I've always uh, scouted a destination in advance. I think it's difficult to, uh, to sell a place that you haven't been to. Um, mm. And it's important to have been there and gotten the local knowledge, uh, made the mistakes, seen what's gone right, and put that together. So it's, it's very difficult, I think, to sell something that you haven't experienced. Uh, this kind of business, if I understand it, sounds like uh, you're you're trying to put together the knowledge that you have of specific locations and hoping that people will purchase it somehow or you make some sort of money on it. Uh, it sounds interesting, but man, the internet is just so full of free advice. Um, and, um, you know, I think it, I don't know anything about that business, but it, it's it seems like it could be really good for the the platform. I don't know <laughs> how much the, someone could really make uh, doing that or how much someone's going to actually pay someone for knowledge that is very freely available on the internet. I'm all about paying someone who's put something together in one place that maybe I can't find or is put together in a particular way. Um, I don't mind that, but uh, just to pay for a city guide or something, um, I'm not sure I see a value in that. Yeah, that's a great point. And it kind of underscores what you've been talking about, about experiential travel um, business where you cr you're crafting a, something very specific for your target market. I think that that is that elevates your travel knowledge. So you, <clears throat> you could have that institutional travel knowledge, but you back it up by bringing a group of people and demonstrating it in person, uh, kind of boots on the ground style. So that makes a yeah, lot of people, sense. People like my trips. They love them because they know my style. Like I said, there's people that have been on 15, 20, 25 of my trips because they know, like, and trust me. They know mm -hmm. that I'm going to provide a similar type experience every time. 
that I've got the same ideas about safety and timing and efficiency and experiences and that they can, you know, just like any business, you have to provide consistent product and my product or service is the trip. So they've come to know what to expect. They don't have to think about anything, but making their flights to and from the destination, which I tell them how and when to do that. And they know that pretty much everything else in between is taken care of. And um, I also do a half day scheduled, half day free time. So they mm. also have some free time to do their own thing. And yeah. that creates a, that that attracts a very different type of traveler. It's not someone who feels like they've got to have 24 hours a day filled with things to do. That's right. not my trip. That's a different type of trip. Yeah, I'm glad you expanded on that because it again, once again, it kind of just demonstrates that if you're going to start a travel business, <clears throat> you know, everyone wants to be known as an expert now, but really the experts have experience, boots on the ground. They can map it out for you. They can suggest where and when you should go somewhere. It's like the whole holistic knowledge of like what you're going to be experiencing when you get there and then bringing you there and then taking you through like having a personal touch with what you're adding is is a crucial aspect to running um, a different type of a different type of travel business. And it makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think that experiences are going to be even more important for these next generations coming up from Gen, Gen X to, you know, baby boomers to, excuse me, Gen X to um, millennials to, to Gen Z. Those are, th- those are three very experiential um generations they want to kind of put their hands in and kind of get to work so that makes a lot of sense all right last one if you travel often you should become a travel agent first join a host agency they'll train you and give you all the certifications that you need once you're ready to book a trip you go through the vendors and find the best deals the vendors decide how much commission you make off that trip you'll get paid about 30 days after the trip it's all self-paced and you get to control your own workload the vendors have a lot of deals for agents so whether you take trips for yourself or you book for your family and friends <clears throat> it's such a great and easy income to have it- okay so is this the structure that you're used to when you when you book trips um do you agree with her assessment of how you set up your travel business yeah, that's a very different type of business to what I do. I, I definitely don't consider myself a travel agent. Um, I, If I do a custom tour for someone who uh, is looking to maybe go on dates that I'm not going to a place, uh, because for my trips, someone has to be available on the dates that my trips are going, but I can also put together a custom trip to a place on the dates that someone wants to go themselves or they've got a family group or something. So that's uh, a new area that I'm in um, that I, that I'm uh, starting to do a little, you know, bit of side, side business that way. But um, I think being a travel agent can be a a really nice business. Uh, Again, I think it's a lifestyle business. I don't think you're going to, you know, really get rich doing it. It takes, it takes a long time for someone to build that following to build the experience. But uh, like I said, it could be a, a really nice lifestyle business. However, you know, being in the industry, I know there's a lot of competition. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of people that are doing that because it looks easy. It's fairly easy to get into. Um, you know, again, it's a lot of these platforms are the ones that are making the money, just getting people to come and pay them to do that. You know, I'm not saying they all are, but, uh, that's, uh, it's a very different type of business and it can be fun if you just want to make a few bucks a month, but, uh, right. I'm not sure how much money is really in that these days. No. <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. And, um, obviously I think she said in that video that it was kind of like a side hustle thing, yeah. but <clears throat> it just also seems like how much, you know, if you have a, if you have a nine to five, um, you know, this seems like that there's a lot of time or like adjustments needed to in your schedule to kind of make that work as well. So maybe you would have to have a kind of a nine, non-traditional nine to five where you can kind of split off your attention and kind of make it work. But you've kind of obviously have proven in your business that you've kind of, you know, jumped in with both feet and, you know, you have to kind of be present in the business and that that's the way it can operate and, and be successful for, for a very long time. Yeah. 
agree. So, um, Ralph, how can people contact you if they want to learn more about you and uh, your business, the Continental Drifter, and uh, if they want to book a tour with you? Sure. So everything is at continentaldrifter.co, and I have a YouTube channel, Continental Drifter. Um, well, it's uh, youtube.com slash Continental Drifter, and you can find me on the social media outlets at Ralph Velasco typically. And um, my YouTube channel's got a lot of great information, travel tips, travel advice, locations. I like to uh, take people on, on, you know, virtually on the trips that I've, that I've been on. I'm mm -hmm. working on a, a video for my latest trip to Antarctica that I just did a couple weeks ago. That and sounds that awesome. <laughs> that was quite the experience. That was the first time I'd ever gotten down there. I was mm -hmm. my seventh continent, but uh, what a place. I mean, you really feel like you're off the grid. You're in a natural, pristine environment. It is was really, really something. I'd always wanted to go, but now having been, it, it was one of the great experiences of my life. It really, um, it, it totally over-delivered. It was fantastic. That's but yeah, uh, continentaldrifter.co is sort of my hub for everything. See mm -hmm. all my trips, my podcast, uh, uh, blog posts, uh, join my mailing list. There should be a pop-up, get a free download, join my mailing list. And about once every uh, two to four weeks, I'll put out a, an email letting people know about uh, things that I have coming up, speaking engagements, trips, and uh, things like that. And uh, you can also email me at ralph at continentaldrifter.co. Awesome. So the, the link to your website um, will be in the, the description of the podcast. So both the video version and the audio version, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts. Ralph, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate um, you kind of experience, you know, kind of delivering on what the travel business is like and how you can actually uh, enjoy your life in a lifestyle type business that actually moves the needle, makes you happy and, you know, shows people something that kind of changes the game for them. So appreciate that. Well, so remember that uh, this podcast is about delivering, not just about the nuts and bolts of business all the time, but sometimes we like to go into the different types of businesses that you can experience. It might relate to because sometimes you start in a in a business or a company as an employee and eventually you kind of you know you can have a deviation to something that you enjoy like ralph um and you know continental drifter he's obviously making an impact on people and the travel in their life so i appreciate the time so remember if you don't go about doing your business you're going to be doing the business of someone else he's ralph i'm micah and we're out of here mm -hmm.